Sharon tells a story of when Heather was just a little bitty girl. Uh, they were in the store and she was begging for something. Mom, I want this. Whatever it was. Mom, get me this. Buy me this. And she said, uh, Sharon put her off and said, I, no, Heather, no, no. And then after about the tenth time of her asking, she finally said, Heather, I don't have the money. And Heather said, don't you got one of those checks? <laughs> the baby girl knew exactly what faith was. Get it today. The money will be in there Friday. Right. Let's just write a check. So she said, well, don't you got one of those checks? We can get it today. Hey, hey, it'll be there. I hope you're not looking like that. God's got bigger for you than that. So praise the Lord. But then John, I thought about him. There was a time that was, I was off one day and I took him. We were out and, and get to get a haircut. And if y'all know me, I got patience with people. I love people. I got patience with their life. I don't have patience with processes. So I don't like waiting in restaurants or haircut places. I, I think you got a process issue. If you're making me wait, you know, develop a better process. But anyway, I don't like waiting for haircuts. So I was, we was rolling down the road and we was just, I was just driving by this one. Nothing too many cars here. And I seen this place that we had never been before. It was called a Hair Creators, Creations or something like that. And, and it was a fairly new business. I, I had seen it pop up over the weeks before that. So I said, there's no cars in the parking lot. I walked in there, me and him go in, and I signed the book, and the girl says, uh, uh, you know, morning or whatever it was, sign the book, and I lay, down, I lay the book down, and me and John go sit down, and we're sitting in the <laughs> waiting chair, and the girl comes out, and she says, excuse me, sir, you do know this is a hair restoration store, don't care business, and I was, I was like, 
he's got a full head of hair, you know, this tall, big old thick head of hair, and I've got plenty, and you know enough, I guess, but she said, you know, this is a hair restoration store, a uh, place, and I said, what's the hair creation? I said, oh, this is a faith work here. They all do a faith work, so people come out of here with hair. But it was very embarrassing to me. I was like, I didn't know. I'm sorry, I didn't know. She had those big eyes like, you know, we don't cut hair. We had hair. It's a faith work. All those things are not as though they are. We're coming out of here with hair. He didn't need no more hair, so we left. So. But faith is such a powerful word. It's such a powerful word. I seen this witness until many years ago. If you uh, for street ministries and people use this to witness, you know they say the hand of the hand, the ring finger is probably the most weakest finger of all five fingers. We don't use it as much. If you're gonna, God forbid, but if you had to lose a finger, this would be the one you'd want to lose because you use it less than you know you really know. And say so, this finger here, your ring finger, represents fallen man, sinful man, man that's hopeless without God because we're useless. We're pretty much useless. Out the Lord. But this finger here represents mankind in a fallen state of sin. Your pinky is something small over here. We forget about it a lot of times, but it represents eternity. Like where you're going to spend eternity, eternity, heaven or hell. And we forget about it a lot of times, but it's still there. It's right there. It's here today. You have to make a decision. Where are you going to spend eternity? We got the pinky finger over here. And man realizes, beginning to think about eternity, that there's an almighty God which is supreme and he stands above all this, the biggest and the largest finger on the, on the hand here. But man begins to realize that there's a higher power and it's the Lord Jesus, the Lord, God, and God in heaven, and he's a Jehovah. He is all authority, all over this. This is his planet. This is his world. He created us. He created in his image. And God had a son. And that son is the pointer finger, and it points to everything, it points back to Jesus. Yes. And that son died and gave his life and rose again for the remissions of this third finger sin, so he could spend eternity in heaven. But the thumb represents faith, because if you don't have the thumb, you got nothing to pull it all together. If you don't have faith, you cannot make a fist and ball up the table. If you was to go grab a baseball bat to hit a ball. And say, I'm not going to use my thumbs. You're not going to get a home run. I promise you that. You might get a, a bunt or something like that. But you're not going to get a home run if you don't grab your thumbs around the bat. to get some power. That's where the power comes from is our faith in God. Swing a hammer and say, I'm not going to use my thumb. You're not going to be as strong as you would with, you, with a hammer grabbing around a plow. You're not going to grab a plow. You can't secure nothing without faith. So thumbs represent the faith that we have. It's such a large word. The Bible says it's our shield, the shield of faith and the armor of God. And the faith is our shield against the fiery darts of the devil because he is going to attack. And you've got to have that shield of faith. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. We should be buried in faithfulness. We should sow faithfulness to others. Faith, uh, faith is a gift of the Spirit, uh, one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's a mentioned gift of the Spirit that we're all given a measure of faith, but there are others that have an exceedingly amount of faith to believe God for things. So it's a gift. And I want to talk this morning about our faith is under attack. The faith, our Christian faith is under attack. We're in a spiritual warfare. Yeah. Yeah. We are not fighting flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. We are not fighting, but this is powers and spiritual things that have been planned for many years. These are demonic powers that we're fighting. And, and look, I see it in people's faces. All of y'all do. I, and I... We talk to other pastors and churches, and you see this heaviness on people. There's just, just they're worried about things. You can see it in people's eyes when you meet them on the street. They look at the news, and they we're taking all this just garbage in. Some of it's garbage, but it's very informative that we know what's going on. But people are wondering, what is this the end? Are we? And that the truth is that is right. We all we have been for many years. Why the Lord's winding this thing down? And there's like a pinky, there's an eternity. You're going to spend it one of two places. There's no joking about that. But the things are on people's mind. I can see it in their eyes. Jesus said, Luke 18 and 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man return, comes, will he really find faith on earth? Now this is a question Jesus asked himself. These are the words of Jesus. I tell you that he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? Over 2,000 year, years ago, Jesus knew that they would be an attack on the faith when he came back. 
And he's asking, will, will I even find faith on earth when I return? Faith is under attack. I believe in the United States that, that September, we just celebrated September the 11th. I think it was uh, 22 years this year, anniversary of that. I believe in some ways that was the last time we stood united as the United States. I can remember the days after that, weeks after that, <laughs> baseball players running across the field with just an American flag and people just roaring the crowd. The, the people were united. You know, people standing on a bridge just holding the American flag and they're just united behind because attack had come on our country. But now look at what we got right now in the churches. Matter of fact, after 9-11, there was a flood and influx of, of attendance and people being saved in church. The Sunday after that, all churches across America reported full houses, people just seeking. They knew where the help was going to come from and they sought the Lord in that. But look at now, where we're at now. <laughs> people are running from faith as quick as they can when something goes wrong. Faith is under attack, and Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. Is when I come back, will I even find faith here on the earth? His half brother, Jude, says that in the last days we would have to contend for the faith. That's like a fight. You don't know what a boxing match is. You're a contender. You've got to fight. He says you're going to have to contend for the faith because of false teachers and false doctrines and things coming into the church. Things like that. He said they're, 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 up, they're creeping in unaware. Unaware. Creeping in. Creeping in. And he said you're going to have to fight for your faith in the last days. Faith is under attack. It is under attack. His other half, Brother James, said that there's a testing to faith. Now, Jesus, these were Jesus' two half-brothers who got books in the Bible. But he said the testing of your faith is going to bring about patience. Uh, and they just, they just... Uh, you, means endurance that just simply means endurance the endurance to go on that you, you know when our faith is tested that we get the power to go on you know how it is if you walk through something you, you get stronger after you come out of it and that creates a better endurance you know you know how to fight then when the next battle comes up you recognize the battle of the enemy and, and it gives us more endurance to stand more yeah. to stand. and let me say this if you're not growing in your, your faith, if you don't have an ever increasing faith, then you've got a problem in your relationship with the Lord. Because I don't care how, amen, how many years you've been saved, if you're not growing in your faith, if my faith is not getting stronger and believe in God for more, and that He can do more in my life, and that He can uh, save more people, that He can heal, if I'm not growing, then I need to back up and find out where my foundation of my faith, of my relationship, my salvation is at, because it is the foundation. To build off faith. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's impossible to satisfy God, to please Him without faith. If you don't have faith, wrap it all up, it up, and you can't make a fist. You can't ball up a fist. What do you do with your fist? You contend and you fight. You know, you know we got to wrap the fist up with them thumb and get strong because He said we would have to contend for the faith in the last days. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, uh, that the day of the Lord, it was Paul's writing to the Thessalonians who thought that the rapture had already taken and they had been left behind. These were church people, believers, that thought the Lord had already come back. And he's comforted them with this letter that he writes to the church <clears throat> saying that, in the, that, that that time will not come, that day will not come unless there first comes a great falling away and the man of sin be revealed. Now that falling away, I believe, is taking place right now. We're seeing that. We have been seeing that. But the devil is ramping his uh, attacks up because he knows he has a short time. And he is getting stronger and stronger with his attacks against the faith. Because our faith is under attack. Everything in this book is under attack by, by, in our own country here, God forbid. But in 1 Timothy 4... Uh, one and two, Paul writes this. I love the scripture. Now the Spirit expressly says, he says, Paul's getting this inspiration from the Holy Ghost right here, and he's writing this. He said, now the Spirit is really, really, really saying, expressly, expressly said, says that in the latter times, and let me talk right there. There's a difference in last and latter. Last days, we've been living in the last days. Since the day of Pentecost, the last days begin. But there's the latter time, which means it's really getting close now. It's really getting close. It's the latter days that we're living in. That in the latter times, some will, look here, depart from the faith. Falling away. Faith is under attack. They're departing from the faith 
And he's speaking to church people here. Remember, the letters are to the church. So he's writing to the church here. To Timothy in a pastoral uh, position. Giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of deacons, uh, demons. Deacons are demons sometimes, by the way. I just said, just tell you. Doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. I want you to think about the mind of people these days and the conscience. Conscience is just moral decision. Morality is out the window now. Gosh, Sharon and I seen a t-shirt yesterday. It said, normal's not coming back, but Jesus is. And she almost bought it. I'm like, I like that saying, normal's not coming back, but Jesus is still coming back. But the conscience and morality is being branded and changed anew. I, I never, and y'all never would have thought you'd see the things today and the acceptance of things today. God forbid, I don't like to give the devil any place or any glory, but I heard this week a church in Dallas honored the drag queens in the community on the stage of the church for the contribution they were making to the, to the kids in the community and things like that. And uh, I said, and, and I think there was a picture actually sur surfaced. I didn't even look at it. But this was on a Christian news report, a reputable Christian news uh, uh, that I follow sometimes. But, and I was like, my God, I mean, did you ever think conscience would be seared so much to where people are just okay with that? Yeah. And that that's going on in the church. I, I, I mean, boys and girls wanting to change the sex and people just being okay with it. The conscience is seared. This is the Bible says this right here. They're departing from the faith and their conscience is being seared with a hot iron, yes. a change of mindset. And it is not right. It is not right. That's a falling away from, from uh, the truth. They're falling away from faith. Uh -huh. Falling away from the truth yes. and believing a lie. That's what the Bible said, that people would exchange the truth for a lie and believe a lie. But the truth will always stand. Yes, this word is true and it will always stand. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes. You cannot deny truth. If you was to go and climb on the top of this building here and jump off and say, I don't believe the truth of gravity anymore, and I'm going to just jump off here, and we're going to pick you up off the ground later on and tear you to the hospital or the more. Yeah. Because this truth, is it doesn't matter what you believe. We can, say, we can stand up there and say, okay, whatever you believe, good luck. That's what's going on in America now. People say, well, I don't believe. I don't believe the Bible really means that, so I'm just not going to take that part of it. And I'm going to believe what I want to believe. That's a that's the denial of the truth. That's the falling away and exchanging the truth of God to believe lies. That's what's going on. Faith is under attack. But here's the big question. People say, what do I do? Yes. What do I do? I'm standing here. We're pastors. There are ministers all over the church. And people, it's just like, what do we do? The, hell, the world's going to hell in the handbag. So what can I do? What do I do? You know, what can I do about it? Because God has foreordained things to do and things to happen. So what am I supposed to do about it? And see, there's a parable that goes along with this scripture. I gave you the last scripture of this parable where Jesus said, Will I even find faith on earth? But the first verse here, first verse of 18 says, and we're going to read through five. And Jesus spoke a parable to them. And Jesus in chapter 17, by the way, is talking about this is the Mount Olivet Discourse, and he's talking about the end times and the, come, come, the second coming. So this kind of context means so much in Scripture, read of a context. And so he's going right from that, talking to this parable. He said, I spoke, he spoke in a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. And now there was in that, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, at least by her continual coming, she wearied me. So what do we do? Jesus told us, Pray and don't lose heart. Don't give up. Because Paul said there, in the last days, some's going to depart from the faith. And they're going to be slowly moving away from the faith. Contend. And the brother said, contend. Fight. Test. Yes. Going to be tested. And Jesus himself said, pray. 
Don't lose heart. Men ought to always pray. Men and women, we ought to always pray and not lose heart. The judge had no respect. In the parable, the judge had no respect for the widow at all. And think about the world today and how they have no respect for the things of God. No respect for the authority of God for the church today and how the world, uh, the rulers of the world today, are constantly wanting to attack our faith. And because our faith is under attack. But we walk by faith yes. and not by sight because, yes. hey, amen, we, we can't worry about what things are going on out there. Jesus said, pray and don't lose heart. Yes. Just pray and don't lose heart. Don't worry about what's going on out there because the world is not saved. We are saved. The world is still in a fallen condition. We have accepted our salvation. Christian people, we, we as believers have accepted our salvation. And there's a lot to be said. The widow represents, I don't know, in Bible times things were much different than they are today. A widow didn't have a chance without somebody to help her out. Uh, there wasn't no social security check coming in. There wasn't no pension plan or life insurance or anything like that. If a, if a man died, a husband died. Uh, matter of fact, the, de the office of the deacons is exactly what that was established because of the widows and the orphans because they wanted to make sure the church was doing their part to take care of the people who couldn't help themselves. Those that had fell on hard times, such as a widow. But the widow, it represents as Jesus would have known, these listening to him would have known, that represents somebody that's totally helpless in the world. And that's just how we are. We can feel that way that we're totally helpless because without the help of God, we have no chance. We, we have no chance to survive. We can't survive. We're totally, when we know that we're totally dependent on the Lord, like the widow was totally dependent on, I gotta get justice. I gotta go to the judge and get justice because she ain't got nobody to fight for. She's got no husband, nobody to earn money for. She's got to go. But there's a lot to be said for persistence. Jesus' focus here is about the persistence of the widow and how she continued to go back and did not lose faith. She didn't lose heart. She didn't give up. She didn't easily give up. Sharon shared a little bit about our testimony last week. If she had gave up on us, we wouldn't be here today. But it's persistence. Persistence in prayer. My daddy, I seen my daddy all my life. Every, he was like clockwork. About every Thursday night, he would make a phone call and invite his two brothers to church. Every, about every, generally on Thursday nights. And I would see him go get the phone. And of course, back in those days, it was the, y'all really you know, <laughs> sit there, let him wind back around the rotary phones, you know, and it like, takes you like five minutes to dial the number on the phone, actually. But he would consistently call them and say, I wish y'all would come to church Sunday. Please come to church. You bless my heart to come to church. There is something to be said about persistence. Yeah. So if you're praying for a lost loved one or a healing or a financial need, don't give up. Jesus said, do not give up. Don't give up. Amen. Continue to pray and do not give up. It's is simple. What do we do? Continue to ask God. Go back persistently and ask God to meet that need, to save that love. And we cannot give up because he said that later times are coming and everybody's going to have a conscious seared and we're just going to say, they're too far gone. No, they're not. They're not too far gone. The world's too far gone. No, it's not. It looks bad out there. It looks bad in the world. But persistence, and whatever you're asking for, is worth waiting on. It's worth continuing to ask on. God's got something good for you. First John 5 and 4. This is hope right here. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. If you've been saved, you are born of God. Yes. And you yes. overcome the world. You are made more than a conqueror. Yes. The Bible says that you are an overcomer. And this is the victory. Can y'all say victory? Yes. Victory. Yes. This, one. this is the victory that, that has overcome the world on faith. I wish they had put that scripture up there. I might not even gave that one to 1 John 5 and 4. But victory comes from faith. Yes. Our faith helps us to overcome the world. Yes. Putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we're already more than a conqueror there. That's the first step of faith right there is believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's for, He died for the remission of our sins. But, yes. but the Bible says we can have victory over everything the world comes at us against. It's our faith. Our faith. Persistence yes. and prayer and the gospel message. Yes. And let me say, add to that, boldly. 
Now I know it looks like you can't do a whole lot, but God, go vote. Because men and women died for your right to vote. You got to keep trusting. It don't change nothing. Sitting at home don't change it either. The women was persistent to go and see the judge. Go to the voting precinct and vote conviction, Christian convictions. Let the Lord lead you in that. The Bible says, uh, if, uh, first part of the second part, I know any of the members, but if my people will call upon my name, my name, then I'm going to humble them. He wants to hear yes. from us. Yes. He wants the persistent widow. When she didn't send somebody else. Will you go get some justice for me? Can you go see if you can work that? No, she went herself. God wants to hear from me and you, his people. And he says, then, then he will hear from heaven if we call upon his name. But the, the, the last point I have this morning, he said, Luke 18 and 6, Jesus says here, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust say, just judge said. Now listen to what, he said, listen to what the, the judge said about this situation. Jesus is teaching us now, and this is where he gets into the nuts and the bolts of it, and like teaching and said, listen to what the judge said. He said, because she called, continues to call, because she didn't give up, because she didn't quit, there's an attack against your faith this morning. Yeah. And it's been going on for a long time. But he said, because she continues to call, then I'm going to grant the wish. Because she did not give up. Because the first time, he, if she'd have never went back again, he'd have been satisfied to lay down and go to sleep. Matter of fact, Jesus told another parable along the same line about a persistent friend who came looking for bread in the middle of the night. And I believe if I remember the parable right, it was after midnight and the friend, he knocks on the door and the friend says, I need bread. The friend says, go away, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some bread tomorrow. I've already went to bed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the kids are in the bed, the, Bible, the family's in the bed. Just go away and come back tomorrow. He knocks again. And again, and again, and again, finally, the man, he says, uh, Jesus told him this parable, finally, he gives him bread, invites him in, and feeds him, he gives him his bread, not because he's his friend, but because he wouldn't leave him alone at the door, <laughs> because he just would not go and quit knocking at the door. But if there's something to be said for persistence and not giving up, because that's what he says here. This is the key to that. Listen to what the judge said, because she keeps coming back and keeps asking, and I'm not going. She's not. She's going to worry me, weary me, until I answer her prayer. And he says, "Shall God not offend His own elect who cry out day and night to Him, though He bear long with them?" Shall God not answer my prayers if I continue to go back and go back and don't lose heart and pray. Pray for our nation. Pray for my faith to be strengthened. Pray for our churches to be strengthened. So Jesus' question was, am I going to find faith when I come back? Are people going to be willing to continue fighting for the faith, being persistent in their prayer for the faith, to know that God will answer if they just keep pushing and pressing through? But I can tell you, as long as you're asking, as long as you're believing, faith is alive. It is alive as long as I know. Amen. Faith lives. As long as you don't give up, faith, the faith is alive. Keep that faith alive. Keep it alive because keep asking. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. He will answer you. I promise you that. But in the book of Revelations, and we're going to give you some good news here, man. I, I know this is not a great positive faith and we were like pretty little uh, fall, the little thing on the put on Facebook, the little pretty little fall faith series or whatever. But faith is under attack. It is under attack. It's under a super attack from the world, from the powers that be. But in the book of Revelation in the uh, uh, sec, uh, sixth chapter, I'm sorry, there's a cry that goes out to the martyrs. I tell you, we are in a blessed nation. Whether we realize that all the problems America has and all this this craziness we were just talking about, God help them, God forgive them. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what their doors they're opening up in, in America are going. But we are still on, in a blessed nation because there is countries. I just watched a little something about this just a week or so ago. It's people's lives, people are being beheaded still for the gospel, for the spreading of the gospel, hide, having to hide under basements and things like that just to have church secretly and knowing that at any point in time anybody could come in and, and, and murder them now there's evil here in America but 
but, but our government's not coming against us for gathering here today. That's still a blessing, and I still count that as a blessing, and I thank God for that. But there's a cry that goes out to, of the martyrs in, in Revelation 6 and verse number 9. And the Bible says here, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? This is why they say what the voices say here. Until you judge and avenge our blood on those who are dwelling on the earth. The same thing that the, the persistent witness said. I need justice. I need, a being, I need to be avenged. I need to be avenged. Lord, how long? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest. It didn't sound like they were resting, did it? <laughs> Rest a while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. What's interesting to me is that some of the scriptures we just read, not not, uh, not that one in Revelation, but some of the, like Paul, Paul's one of these voices crying out in the martyr because Paul died in martyr's death, John. I mean, not John, but uh, Luke. All of them died these martyrs' death, and to know that their voices are the ones those apostles yeah. are calling out in heaven right now. So how long, Lord? Not only them, but the ones that died a week ago or a month ago. Yes. There's these martyrs in heaven. You know, in the uh, we're going in this faith series, and of course everybody knows uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is the Hall of Fame, the heroes of the faith. You know who the first person mentioned in that whole list is? It's Abel. Abel. Because Cain killed Abel. Because Abel brought a more excellent sacrifice. And sin said, oh, he's the first one mentioned in that whole chapter of Hebrews 11. That he, he, he's the first person of faith mentioned. Because you know what? He has faith to bring the right sacrifice. The best of his sacrifice. The first fruits, the Bible says, to, to him. So, and and the, the Bible says immediately after the death of uh, Cain killed Abel that his blood cried out to the Lord from the ground. The Lord hears these people who are suffering. Mark, God pray that we need to pray for those on the witness and field, those on the battlefield and in these foreign countries. Because the Bible says that the, the blood cried out to the Father immediately. And that's what the book of Revelation is here is, 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 is the, the cries of the martyrs going up to the Lord and say, How much longer are we going to have to wait? And he says here, listen to what he says. He says, To judge and avenge those that are on the earth, those that come against the Lord. Now I, I, we don't have the time this, this morning to get into too much of this, but there'll be 144,000 Jews sealed during the end time. But the Bible says they'll be sealed in their head from all 12 tribes, 12,000 from all the 12 tribes, and they'll be sealed. And that they won't be touched, they can't be harmed, but they will be able to win a multitude because it goes on in uh, chapter 7 of the book of Revelation to say, I saw, after all of this, I saw a multitude. That no man could number. Absolutely, there was no way to count the multitude that I seen. And he says, John says, "Who are these? Who are these people?" And they said, uh, the, the, the elder told him, "said These are these. Are, they were all clothed in white." By the way, he said they were clothed. He said these are those who are coming out of great tribulation. Great tribulation. Now, I'm going to get doctrinal just for a second here, and I don't know where everybody in the room stands on that, but I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah. I believe the Lord is going to rapture the church out of here before too many times of tribulation. Now, he did say that that man of sin would be revealed, I believe. In some ways, we see a new thing shape up, and we may be identifying that's, that's him, that's an antichrist. The spirit of antichrist has been alive. For a long time, the spirit of Antichrist is just anything that exalts itself above God and that denies the, the very deity and the blood of Jesus Christ. Denies that's the spirit of Antichrist, but there's an Antichrist coming to rise up that will exalt himself above God. But I believe in a pre tribulation rapture of Romans 5 and 9 and the Roman road. If you're reading about salvation, Paul writes in there, We have been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from the wrath to come? If I can believe that, that the blood of Jesus has justified me and saved me while I'm here, then how much more will he not save me from the wrath that's on the way, the wrath that is to come? That's what the words of Paul. Jesus said the same as it was in the days of Noah. That's exactly the way it was going to be. That's what he said when they asked for a sign. 
uh, the, the, the way, the, the days of Noah, they were married, giving in marriage, eating, drinking, going on, living life just like anything else. And I believe Noah was a picture of the rapture and the church being carried out of here because when God shuts the door, yeah. the door is shut. Yes. Noah was righteous above all. The Bible says that, that God looked on mankind and he repented that he made man because it was so bad, horrible, the things that were going on in the world. And he found one righteous man out of the whole world. And he asked him to do something. He asked him to build an ark. He was faithful to the Lord to do that, to be obedient to him. And he found righteous in the, in righteousness in the eyes of the Lord. And when he was done, and the Lord shut the door on the ark, and he sealed the ark, that ark was lifted to safety as the world was above, got the wrath of God through the water and the blood. But as it was in the door of the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. When God shuts that door, it's going to be over with. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And Jesus is coming soon. And if you've read the back of this book, you know we win. Yes. Even though our faith is under attack, yes. it's under attack. Yes. But we win. Yes. We win. Yes. We win. Yes. And our hope, what Jesus told us, is pray. Don't lose heart. Continue to pray. Joel, Joel says that in the last days that he is going to pour his spirit out on all flesh. Yes. All flesh. I just heard this week, I was telling you about the Christian news. I believe it's CBN News, you know, Christian broadcast and news is where I've seen that before about the drag queens in church. But there's, uh, there's some good things. <laughs> I just heard this week they had a, a revival breakout in Texas A&M. And a young man got up out of a wheelchair and walked out of college. Yeah. And I think that's something that they were faithful enough to see that young man heal. That, and I think there was 100, 120. How about the significance of that number? 120 was baptized yeah. that same day at a revival on the campus. It was February of 2023, just this year, when the uh, couple students at Asbury said, you know what? Yeah. We're just not going to leave. We're just going to stay and worship. <laughs> For the rest of the day and then that day turned into the next day and weeks and went on for i don't know how many weeks and just an outpouring of god's spirit there and it was just overflowing and going on i find hope in that i really do i find hope in that i'm so and I, this next generation and i think about our own grandkids i get to witness that with my own two eyes and i think about and i know everybody thinks there's the best or whatever but when i see my uh, colin's heart it, you know, his, he loves the Lord and how it just, it's don't even, it's, it's not second nature. It's just second nature to him to pray for his food. And when he got a job, the first thing Heather told him said, you're going to have to do two things. <laughs> Buy your gas and pay your tithes. We'll do everything else. And it, it, but teaching those from, I got hope in the next generation. Yes, yes. I got hope in these kids over here. I got hope in what God's doing. <laughs> Just so the world wants to give me all the bad news, there's some good things going on. The Bible is in there. And I believe we're in these latter times when Joel said, I'm going to pour my uh, spirit out of all flesh. I believe revival, we're on the verge of revival. And we've got to do what Jesus said. Now come on to the music this morning. Jesus said, Will I find faith? I'm going to say yes, Lord, this morning. Will you say yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. I'm, going to, I'm going to contend for my faith. I'm going to fight for the faith that I have in Jesus Christ. And as long as we've got faith, faith is alive. As long as we're asking, as long as I'm being persistent, I, faith is alive. Faith is alive.